everybody, Eric Magidson here. So, um, module three, Hyper-V. So let's talk Hyper-V and Server 2012 R2. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna say about Hyper-V, you know, is the, is the generalization. We'll talk about these. We'll go through installing Hyper-V, using Hyper-V Manager, configuring resource metering, everything else. So when we get down to those slides that are, you know, 15 slides showing you what the next step with installing Hyper-V is, we're gonna pass that because we're gonna do that in class, in person. So virtualizing servers. Um, why do we virtualize servers? Well, you know, the key to virtualization today is that we have the hardware, first of all, you know, within the chipsets that support virtualization, basically giving us a hybrid model of the physical environment that we can simulate within software so that we can run multiple independent machines, servers in our case, um, desktops, whatever you'd like, on a single base operating system. So we're no longer having to quad boot and thus get stuck in a single operating system. Uh, the other reason we're doing this is of course, you know, servers and the, the hardware resources and servers have gotten so vast uh, so quickly that we simply can't buy a server that, that would be good for just Active Directory, for example. We would have too much server, too many processors, too much memory, too much bus speed. So we want to utilize these physical investments as, as well as we can. And of course the challenge becomes SQL wants to be on a dedicated server, Exchange wants to be on a dedicated server. You can't put an Exchange server on a server that's running Active Directory, for example. So how do we do that? Well, we create one that's virtualized for Active Directory, one that's virtualized for SQL, one that's virtualized for Exchange, SharePoint, whatever. And we don't have those interoperability issues, in our case, amongst server platforms, You know, whether it be email, database, whatever the case may be, web hosting, whatever. So they do require a host operating system. now couple different host operating systems. Number one, Windows Server 2012 R2, which we're talking about, and 2016, of course, have the role of Hyper-V that we can install. So we can do that. The other option we have is to go out, and I'm looking at our what used to be DreamSpark, Microsoft Imagine, so you all have this software available, and that's the Hyper-V server. So basically what that is, is it's similar to a core server, we're not gonna use all of our resources on the base OS. We're gonna have just the minimal operating system requirements to instantiate virtual machines and, and we'll get a better look at that. So gotta have a host of some sort that can be an operating system. It can be GUI in our case because we're learning. We're gonna do this on GUI. Um, it can be core and it can be Hyper-V server. So here's an example of virtualization. Here's that hardware, so the physical hardware. The host operating system you know, lives in and throughout. We have a hypervisor, which we'll talk about more in a minute, and then the virtual machines with the guest operating systems. So type one virtualization, you know, no host operating system required. This is the older type, so it's gonna support uh, the older operating systems and their needs, okay? So no host operating system is sharing a processor. Parent partition runs in the virtual stack, which creates and manages the child partitions. So, you know, here's an example. Here's the hardware. This is the hypervisor. So this would be like Hyper-V server, you know, and then parent and child permissions uh, throughout. So hypervisor, you know, providing all hardware access. That's what the hypervisor does, creates that simulated environment for each partition, okay? So different imp implementations. Well, <clears throat> Hyper-V as a role is required for an operating system. Let me just quickly show you, and hopefully I'm not talking too fast. Let me show you, this is my Windows 10 machine and Hyper-V is also a role on my Windows 10 machine. So I can instantiate Hyper-V and use it just like I would on a server. Now, granted, I don't have the processing and the memory resources on my laptop, but it's a great way, as you can see, I'm running an Active Directory domain here. I've got two Active Directory uh, domain controllers and I've got a Windows 10 virtual machine uh, installed. And I actually have more, I just haven't instantiated them back to this edition since I rebuilt my system. So no special requirements are needed for guest operating systems, Microsoft or non-Microsoft. Um, the key though is, you know, we do need to have 
uh, only standard and data center. Now standard is gonna give us two instances of virtual machines. Data center licensing gives us unlimited virtual machines. So if we have a huge physical environment, we can create wonderful, uh, wonderful um, corporate level, tons of virtual machines, you know, to run an entire business, uh, large or small, by the way. So must have licenses for both the physical and the virtual instances of the operating system. Uh, data center licensing allows you to create and run an unlimited number of VMs where standard only two. Okay, so that's what our licensing. So we have to be aware of licensing. Uh, Hyper-V host system up to 320 logical processors, up to 2048 virtual CPUs. So just amazing what we can do, up to two terabytes of, of physical memory. So one server can host 1,024 active VMs. That is one huge server. I'd love to have one of those. Each VM can have up to 64 virtual CPUs and up to one terabyte of memory. So Hyper-V can support clusters with up to 64 nodes and 8,000 virtual machines. What does this mean? Data center. So Hyper-V server, it is a subset of Windows Server. It's that Hyper-V role essentially. It's free downloadable product. It does not include licenses for the operating systems installed in the VMs. So still we're gonna need either that data center license for multiple VMs, standard license or whatever. OS we're going to run, we definitely need those licenses. And you know, this is a good time to remind you all, you all are in a career where ethics are hugely important. Be ethical with your licensing. We will talk at some point about the Software Business Assurance, SBA, which can come in and audit you. And you know, basically $180,000 per software title fine that is unlicensed in your organization. So think about a small business, much cheaper to stay current and stay legal than it is to get audited. So back to this, uh, includes Hyper-V role and limited file and, and storage services, remote desktop capabilities, because that's how we're going to manage these machines. We're going to get in through a remote desktop. Hyper-V role is installed by default and only uses server core interface. So consequently, we're gonna need to know all of those commands. So installing Hyper-V, you know, creating virtual machine settings, pretty easy. Um, if we're in a server 2012 GUI environment, we just go up, add the role, and install Hyper-V. So we install the role, it does require a restart, comes back up, um, you know, put other roles on VMs if we'd like, you know, use server core installation. As we'll see, there's some unique requirements for running Active Directory within a VM. We always want to do research to find out, you know, if I'm not running this on a physical machine, are there some unique requirements that I need to meet through my VMs in order to successfully run some of these applications? So Hyper-V hardware, 64-bit processor cores with assisted virtualization. So our BIOS has to support the virtualization feature. It has to be enabled. Most machines today, that's enabled by default. Uh, not a big issue. My last laptop, it was in there, but it wasn't enabled by default. So to run Hyper-V or run VMware, I had to go in and enable that. So uh, hardware data execution prevention, you know, Intel describes as, you know, disable XD and AMD describes as no execute. So keep that in mind, you know, we have to do that. Here's installing. So we just go in, you know, we're in the add roles wizard. And as we know, all these things are roles on a server now. They're not installed by default. It's a security thing. So we'll click Hyper-V. We'll install any supporting things that it needs. Um, it's going to go out and look for virtual switches or we can create them at a later date. Server to send and receive live migrations if we'd like. Where are we going to store them? So keep in mind when we talk about I.O., uh, we may want many partitions so that we can read and write to multiple partitions at a time when it comes to virtualize or virtualization of machines. So still kind of questioning, you know, how solid state is going to work on virtual machines, um, you know, from the aspect. And of course, I'm testing that now, you know, a server constant read writes, you know, and at some point they say the solid state drives are going to fail. We'll check that out. Um, as I use that server over the coming years. So using Hyper-V Manager, well, you know, that's, that's what we had here. This is Hyper-V Manager. 
And as we'll see, pretty easy to create a new virtual machine. We just come over here, choose new virtual machine. We'll choose next. We give the machine a name. I suggest giving it the name to match the name that you're going to put in as the computer name, okay? So we do that. We can store the virtual machine in a different location. So again, we can offset certain virtual machines. Um, for example, if I've got multiple partitions, uh, RAIDs that I can write to, I wanna put one DC on one, one DC on the other, maybe the next virtual machine, hop back and forth so that I you know, limit that read-write barrier uh, as to efficiency of a machine. Here's Gen 1, you know, basically what you need to know here, 32-bit. Windows 7 and older requires a Gen 1 machine. 8 uh, and above can go on a Gen 2, um, et cetera. So just from a client standpoint, you choose next. We'll talk about dynamic memory in another lecture, but basically dynamic memory, we can set some memory. If we ask it to be dynamic, it's not gonna allocate all of it. If we tell it to all, uh, start up memory, it's gonna allocate that memory and take that memory from the base OS to be dedicated to the virtual machine. So if we're running a bunch of virtual machines, we can use dynamic memory and let it manage. Now, of course, the most efficient is to have that static memory, have it available to the machine so it's not constantly having to go back and forth asking for more memory, thus affecting the performance of the virtual machine. Here's a little V switch that I created. So if I attach this to this virtual switch, it's gonna have access through the physical NIC on my laptop out to the internet. So it's gonna actually use that as its network interface connection. And as we'll see, best practice is to actually dedicate physical NICs to specific virtual machines, create that teaming that we've already learned about and be redundant. So we just go through this process, 60 gigs, et cetera. It instantiates the virtual machine and off we go. Primary graphical tool for creating and managing VMs is the Hyper-V Manager that we just looked at. It can be used to manage VMs on multiple servers. So again, we can attach VMs, have a single management tool. I can even use the VMware Manager on my machine to manage uh, machines off-site. Installed with Hyper-V Role, or you can install the Hyper-V Management Tools, the RSAT package for Windows 8, Windows 10, etc. So we can have that management tool running Using Hyper-V, create a virtual machine. Well, guess what? We just did that. You should slow down and read these. So go ahead and pause. Know what a virtual hard disk is, what the machine configuration file is. If we do a save state, uh, say we're doing some testing um, and we want to save a state, we can do that so that we can always get back to that state. Now, I do not suggest that on production machines. We're talking about lab environments where I'm going to try something, see if it works. If it doesn't, I can always revert back. Oops, that didn't work. I can revert back. I'm not having to rebuild or restore backups that way. So anyway, it goes through that process that I just showed you. Gen 2s, again, you know, uh, a little bit more information about those so you can read on that. So pause. Uh, Hyper-V implementation includes new type of virtual machine, you know, which refers to as Gen 2. We get the UEFI boot, which you should be familiar with, SCSI disks, 64-bit, uh, you know, server, Windows 8, like I said, Windows Server 2012, 2012 R2, so Generation 2 only support. And then, of course, uh, I built them with Windows 10, and I've built um, Generation 2 with 2016. So there's that screen for you. You know, Hyper-V Windows 2012 supports all of the following. Notice. It's showing you what it's supporting. It does support more servers. You can find information on putting a Ubuntu server or an Apache server, or et cetera, out there. Microsoft's just saying, hey, this is what we support. So keep that in mind. So uh, start an installation from a DVD or an image file. I tend to use image files, ISOs. They're a quick install. We'll do one of those so you can see how that works. You're gonna do it yourself. I'm gonna give you image files to work with. So we're not gonna to have to worry about, we're basically gonna mount an ISO as a virtual DVD. We'll use it and then we'll do an uninstall. So next time the machine boots, the virtual machine boots, it's not giving you that prompt to hit any key to boot from a CD. So, and we might wanna use that virtual CD for installation of software, for example. So operating system shutdown, 
you know, time synchronization is important to synchronize OS clocks and the parent and the child partitions, you know, data exchange. So enable the OS on the parent and the child partitions to exchange information such as OS version information, fully qualified domain names again. Um, but a suggestion um, is do not run the host to have any roles on it. Okay, so do everything, virtualize everything. The host just needs to be the base OS. It's not going to be an Active Directory domain controller or an exchange server or whatever the case may be. You know, backup allows backup of Windows VMs using volume shadow copy service. So we have that built in. We'll talk about that more in the future. So uh, installing the guest, yeah, you know, using enhance mode. So Hyper-V, when you open a virtual machine connection window in Hyper-V Manager console, you receive mouse and keyboard connectivity plus a limited cut and paste functionality. We can also share USB drives between the VM and the physical machine, etc. We can share as much as we want, audio, printers, clipboards, smart cards, USB devices, like I said, drives. So if we have some SAN drives that we want to share across, we can. Allocating memory, again, like I said, it's either going to be static or dynamic. Um, I suggest static for performance, especially in a production environment. In our lab environment, dynamic, so you're not necessarily wasting a bunch of memory. Now, we have 32 gigs of RAM in a server that we're playing with. Um, you can certainly allocate two gigs per server and you'll have a good functioning lab environment. Wouldn't recommend it for a production environment. So again, dynamic memory, startup, minimum RAM, maximum RAM, you know, the buffer. So we can manage our RAM better, thus allocating RAM where it's needed. So if we're running many virtual machines and we're willing to take that performance hit or we have to take the performance hit because of our limited memory on the physical machine, um, this is going to allocate the memory to the virtual machines where it's needed. So in the case of a domain controller, for example, um, we don't need a ton of memory except maybe Monday mornings or mornings, you know, when people are logging in and authenticating. We get more memory when we need it and then it can be allocated elsewhere when we're up and running. So, so memory allocation, you know, what the memory is going to be. Uh, smart paging, it's a new feature. So if a VM has to restart and there's not enough memory available to allocate its startup RAM value, the system uses hard disk space to make up the difference and, you know, begins paging memory context to the disk. Now, keep in mind, um, on solid state, you're not going to see that much of a performance hit, but on, you know, traditional, even SAS, you know, and SATA drives, um, you know, that startup's going to take a while. So keep that in mind as we look at performance. Performance does degrade, of course. It's like, you know, maximizing the memory on your laptop, desktop. Remote FX, a Windows Server feature that enables remote computers to connect Hyper-V guest VMs with an enhanced desktop experience. So kind of cool there. You know, graphics adapter virtualization, USB redirection. So definitely a lot of good stuff coming down. I'll let you read more about that. Resource metering, of course, so we can see what's going on with CPU utilization, minimum, maximum, average memory utilization, disk space, etc. You know, uh, metering uses PowerShell commandlets to track a variety of performance metrics uh, for individual VMs. So we have that ability to ma monitor and manage. And what I suggest is when you're putting up a new physical machine, create a baseline with some of these PowerShell commandlets so that if we need more memory, we need to expand, um, add additional processors or whatever, we can do that as well. So you can go in and learn how to configure resource monitoring. So that's it for lesson one. I'm going to go ahead and pause. We'll talk about creating and virtual machine storage uh, in the next video. So take care.